welcome to the finale for season 12 of the Lord of the Rings Online, The Mines of Moria. As I look across this empty hallway here leading from the mines into the first hall, I can think back of all the adventures I've had here. I think it's been close to 50 or 60 episodes. It's certainly been a big milestone that I've been looking forward to accomplishing for a very long time. But it is time to turn my gaze towards the east and out of the Mines of Moria into Lothlorien. That is the site of the next season. But as always, I do like to go over all the deeds in a region on the finale of the episode. So I would like to discuss all of the deeds here in Moria. It's going to take me a long time to put together this episode, but I hope you guys enjoy it. So before I start any new season, I like to take a look at a few things. Namely, I like to take a look at my skill points here, my class traits. And I don't have any points available, so there's nothing for me to do here. Next, I want to look at this. Now, I said this probably wasn't going to change for the rest of the playthrough, but I changed my mind. I think I'm going to use the Hobbit Club damage and exchange that out for this Virtuous Hobbit. And I think that when I update my First Age weapon next, I may go with a one-handed club as opposed to a spear. That way I can get a plus five percent damage i think that's going to work out well if you guys have any tips for me in terms of first stage weapons please do let me know and then next up i've been doing a little bit of reading on the warden and a lot of you have left plenty of comments in some of the videos which i greatly appreciate and a lot of you guys are saying that i need to not be stacking so much might and after doing a little bit of research that certainly does make sense I've been putting way too much might into my character, where really I should be focusing on agility and vitality. So one of the ways I'm going to address that is by getting rid of fortitude, and I'm going to replace it with loyalty. That way I can stack a little bit more vitality and some armor value as well. So let's do that. I'm not sure why this popped up. I didn't click anything. That was kind of weird. Anyways... So yeah, that's that's the update I'm going to be making there, and it should beef up my HP almost to 8,000 now, which is pretty good. Alright, so next up I do want to talk about some of my items and my gear. Now the problem with this stretch between level 60-ish, maybe 65 all the way to 75, is that there really isn't that much gear for me to be using in between, so I'm kind of stuck with what I have for right now. It may be a while before I update this, so as you can see, this is all level 58 gear, so certainly outdated, but I'll make do with what I have for now, at least. The same goes for my first stage weapons. Unfortunately, this is a level 60 spear, and then I have a level 65 javelin, and really for me to make a new first stage weapon, I could make a level 65 one, but it takes so much resources to get the first stage weapon to its maximum that I don't think it's worth it until I get to level 75 when I can craft a brand new level 75 spear and javelin. So I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stick with what I have for now and then I will upgrade at level 75. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I recorded most of the Moria season and then it's actually been a pretty long time since I recorded the last episode and this one I've been going through and editing everything. So I can't remember if I showed you guys this javelin or not. If I didn't, this is a javelin that I crafted. And it's not the best, but I did upgrade it to the best of my ability. And especially some of the settings and all that thing. That kind of helps me out a lot. Let me actually pull it up here a little bit better. Good DPS. I went with light damage upgrade. Gambit life tap damage. Spear gambit damage. A little bit of random agility as well. Or wait a minute, it says my spear, not my javelin. I knew that looked a little weird. Sorry about that. Yeah, so the javelin, good DPS. I got some evade rating, some frame morale regen, spear shield gambit damage. That's pretty helpful. Shield gambit line healing is helpful as well for when I'm trying to recover HP. So that's that. And then I got some tier 9 settings. And again, I really need to stop stacking might. But I got some agility here. And some block rating and incoming healing. And then my symbol of battle that I crafted. So there's all that. 
Next, going into a season, I like to get a new title pertaining to the one that I'm coming out of. So for Boria, I'm going in as Kippen, Proudfeet, Explorer of Kaza Doom, and that will take me into my adventures in Lothlorien. So finally, that brings us to the meat of the episode, and that's going to be the deeds. And there's a ridiculous amount of them. So... That was instances. I was so confused for a second. There you go. Anyways, there's a bunch of them. So there's Moria General, and then there's the Moria Lower Deeps, Moria Central Halls, and Moria Upper Levels, and I believe that's it. Yes. So there's a couple of deeds here that I have not finished. There is the meta deed to complete quests in Kaza Doom. And you can see that I have not finished the quest in Dimril Dale. The reason for that is that Dimril Dale is an area immediately outside of Moria. And I think it's much better to fit that in with the Lothlorien season. It makes much more sense. So it kind of gets lumped into Moria, but I'm, I'm saving it for next season. So that's the reason I haven't been able to finish that one yet. And then another one is this meta deed to complete all these. And the Twist Tongue deed is part of some of the riddle quests that I did this season, but it finishes again right outside of Moria here, so I'll be able to complete that then. Otherwise, let me talk about some of the other de deeds here. There are some exploration deeds, like the Bulwarks of the Enemy, Explorer of Kaza Doom, and the Steps of the Fellowship, Reflections for Finding All the Mirrors. The Pits of Moria is kind of like a hidden secret deed that I'll go over with you momentarily. And of course, there are the Slayer deeds, Deep Claw, Dragonets, Lobsnaga, Goblin, Grodbog, Morvale, Nameless Slayer, Orc Slayer, Spider. There are Triumph Within the Deep Steed, and that's for defeating numerous foes. And I guess that's the meta deed for some of the Slayer. There's Troll Slayer, Warg Slayer, Worm Slayer. Then moving on to the Lower Deeps, there's the Flaming Deeps Exploration Deed, the Foundations of Stone, the Waterworks, all Explorations. And then there are, of course, the quests. There is the Central Halls, Discovering Adventures in Zella Melek, Noon Melek, The Great Delving, Redhorn Loads, Silver Teen Loads, Zella Melek, all exploration deeds. And then there are some quest deeds as well. And finally, the upper levels, A Deep Well, which is a secret deed I'm going to be showing you. Eastern Duren's Way, Cliffs of Xerix Ziggle, Western Duren Way, and then some quests. So. As you can see, it's a ton of deeds, but I hope you guys enjoyed this episode because there's going to be a lot of sightseeing to be done. So let's go ahead and show all that right now. The first exploration deed is called Bulwarks of the Enemy, in which I need to explore the strongholds of the enemies within Moria. The first landmark is Menemberej. The Great Pit of Menemberej once held one of the richest loads of Mithril ever discovered in Khazad Doom and this enormous platform was constructed to aid the dwarves in their efforts to extract the precious metal. Though this mine was believed to be mostly played out by the time of the fall of Khazad Doom, the dwarves of the expedition hoped to find some remaining veins to prove the value of this dangerous foray and to draw more of their brethren from abroad in aiding them in reclaiming their ancient home. The next landmark is Harrisgund. The gateway of Harrisgund leads to the source of one of the greatest waterways in all of Khazad Doom. It once supplied water to nearly half of all the dwarves who lived beneath these mountains. But it was broken by some unknown calamity during the long dark years after the fall of Durin. Now the water lies here unmoving, flooding the deeps in great stagnant pools. The next landmark is the Forges of Khazad Doom. The Forges of Khazad Doom were without rival, greatest of all the forges in the Third Age of Middle Earth. The dwarves will not rest until it has been reclaimed, for much of the priceless artistry born in that hall has been lost to the long years of Moria's abandonment. Next is Phil Goshen. The orcs of Phil Goshen are suspiciously watchful, brooding over their hopeful assault against Lothlorien. They show no mercy to any who dare threaten their plans. Next is the Gate of Ruin. The Gate of Ruin opens upon the endless stairs of Khazad Doom. 
but as its name now suggests, this doorway into the stairs has been shattered and lies in ruins. Next is Schoonfield. The orc graves in Schoonfield have bred many sickening creatures, all grown strong in the flesh of the dead, and all consumed with evil thoughts. Next is the Dark Delvings. Dark Delvings should have been left forgotten, for they are haunted by ancient and fell creatures with no place in Middle-earth. Finally, there is the 16th Hall. The 16th Hall is now a home to the fungal disease that poisons many orcs and turns them into corrupted Globsnaga. Great evil brews in this hall, threatening to cover Moria in sickness and fear. The next exploration deed is called In the Footsteps of the Fellowship, in which I followed the path of the Fellowship through Moria. The first landmark is Durin's Threshold, the threshold of the western gate of Khazad Doom. It was here that Durin completed his legendary journey through the heart of the mountains and came once again into the light of the sun, having discovered the place that would become his people's home for ages to come. Next is the Chamber of the Crossroads. This ancient guardroom controls the passage leading up into Durin's Way, as well as the ones east toward the 21st Hall. It is now occupied by part of the Dwarf Expedition to reclaim Moria from the orcs and goblins who now hold sway. Next is the 21st Hall. The 21st Hall is among the largest in all of Khazad Dûm and often regarded as the most famous. In times long past, a great market stood here where the Dwarves of Moria and travelers from abroad would trade in fine goods from across much of Middle Earth. Fine woods and wine and foodstuffs would be exchanged for gold and priceless gems and finely wrought pieces of smithcraft. In truth, nearly anything that could be bought or sold within this very hall, though it is hard to imagine to look upon it now. Next is the Chamber of Mazar Bul. It is likely that the Chamber of Mazar Bul once served some great ceremonial purpose in the old days of Moria. Now it remains the tomb of Balin, son of Fundin, an old friend to Bilbo, who not so many years ago led an expedition much like the current one to retake Moria and restore it to its glories of old. Next is the West Arch of the Bridge of khazad -dûm. The Bridge of khazad was conceived as an ancient defense designed to deter any who might seek to invade the city. The Chasm it crosses is amongst the largest in Moria and has been here since the city was founded thousands of years ago. Now the bridge lies in ruin, its western span jutting forlornly out over the depths of the chasm, the very stone shattered and charred by unknown forces. Next is the Eastern Arch of the Bridge of khazad -dûm. The Bridge of khazad -dûm has stood over this great chasm for many a long age, but does so no more. The Eastern Span now reaches out like a finger, pointing it into the darkness beyond. It seems that whatever destroyed the bridge fell not so long ago, as the flakes of rock can still be seen occasionally cracking away from the shattered tip to the fall into the chasm, and fresh arrows pepper the stonework here. Finally, there is the first hall. The first hall was the original entrance to khazad Doom, where Durin first set foot in the caverns that would one day become the greatest city of the dwarves, and indeed, the most enduring city of any people in the long history of Middle-earth, until at last it fell into ruin.
The next exploration deed is the Great Delving to explore the Great Delving of Moria. The first landmark is Durin's Threshold, the threshold of the western gate of Khazad Doom. It was here that Durin completed his legendary journey through the heart of the mountain and came once again into the light of the sun, having discovered the place that would become the home of his people for ages to come. Next is the Dovin View. The Dovin View acts as a window to the great delving below. From here, dwarves could once be seen bustling to and fro, visiting the markets, libraries, and workshops of this once lively cavern. Now there is only a long, lonely view of goblin fires and vile insects crawling through the dark. Next is the Dwarf Lord's Gate. As the northern gate of the Great Delving, the Dwarf Lord's Gate provides the main passage for those seeking to reach Durin's Way. Next is the Lonely Span. The Lonely Span lies just beyond the eastern gate of the Great Delving. It is the only direct passage to the streets of Zelimelech, and is where the nobles of Khazad Doom once resided. Next is the Stone Council. Great carving on the walls of this ancient grotto represent the ancient dwarf council that advised Durin and aided in the daily administration of Khazad Doom. Many of these great carvings have been damaged by time and wear, though luckily the bridge that spans this space remains intact, even if somewhat peerless. Next is Gazatmur. The Great Plaza of Gazatmur was once the heart of the Great Delving, surrounded by some of the most prestigious institutions and finest architecture within Khazad Doom. Now it has been overrun by a large goblin encampment that prevents the dwarves from regaining control of the Delving. Next is Shemel Dirge. Shemel Dirge was an unusual estate constructed by an eccentric but famous architect of the late Second Age. In a departure from classical dwarf design, it features fanciful spans and buttresses that challenge the observer to seek each and every turn to discover where it next goes. Much of it lies in ruins spoiled by time and the ravaging hands of goblins. Finally, there is the Palace of Nine. After the fall of Durin, Terra grasped the dwarves of Moria, now seized by panic and fear. Good Nine took his father's place and strove to quell the madness that threatened the Sauls, wishing to restore peace to his brethren. His short reign was a valiant one, but he too fell to the bane of Khazad-dûm. The next exploration deed is the Silver Teen Lodes, to explore the Silver Teen Lodes of Moria. The first landmark is the Deep Descent. The Deep Descent is an old guard chamber that oversees the entrance into the mines below. The master of this chamber has allowed the Dwarf Expedition to control the passage between the Silver Teen Lodes and the Great Delving, preventing the goblins from massing together into an unstoppable horde. Nevertheless, they remain badly outnumbered and are pressed daily to hold the chambers against the vicious foes that inhabit the deeps. Next is Gamophilic. Once a bustling mine worked by hundreds of industrious dwarves, Gamophilic has been overrun by goblins and is now one of the largest strongholds of their kind within Moria. If the goblins' hold on Western Moria is to be broken, the enemies in Gamophilic must eventually be routed. But against such numbers, it seems an impossible endeavor. Next is Menem Berej. The Great Pit of Menem Berej was once home to the richest loads of mithril ever unearthed in Khazad Doom. This enormous platform was constructed to assist the dwarves in their mighty efforts to extract the precious metal. Though this mine was believed to have been sapped of most of its resources by the time Moria fell, Broger and Bozi's dwarves vowed to find some valuable remnants of the riches that were once so abundant.
Finally, there's the old Silverteen City. The old Silverteen City is in the south of the Silverteen Lodes and was likely the home of the miners that once sought Mithril beneath the Great Mountain. The next exploration deed is Western Durin's Way to explore the western area of Durin's Way in Moria. The first landmark is the Chamber of the Crossroads. This ancient guard room controls the passages leading up to Durin's Way as well as the ones east towards the 21st Hall. It is now occupied by part of the dwarf expedition to retake Moria from the orcs and goblins. Next is the Hall of the High Stair. These stairs lead up to the upper halls of Durin's Way. They were likely built before the larger road to the west was completed, and the room in which they were constructed may have been part of the original course Durin charted through Moria as he explored its depths. Next is Glokuru. These ruined workshops and dwellings once housed a family of dwarves who were famous for their skill in crafting wondrous toys in intricate designs of wood and metal. Such simple joys were lost long ago when darkness fell upon Khazad-dûm and the orcs came. Next is Nicknock Faltor. Whatever its original purpose was, a large host of goblins has made its residence in the halls of Nicknock Faltor. Their dark shrines and crude constructions litter the area, and their sheer numbers pose a serious threat to any hopes of retaking Durin's Way. Next is Tharak Bazan. Tharak Bazan is a most unusual wonder to find beneath the roots of a mountain. It is more commonly known as Durin's Garden, for Durin himself ordered it built so that any dwarf might come here and be reminded of the wider sunlit world beyond the bounds of Moria. Clever constructs of polished metal and crystal guide light down from above to grant life here beneath the mountain. It seems that evil things that now infest Moria likewise find the light uncomfortable, for among all the works of the dwarves, Tharak Bazan remains relatively unharmed by their ravages. Next is Salab Nurjandul. Salab Nurjandul was once the busiest intersection in all of Moria. Each day hundreds if not thousands of dwarves have passed through here going about their lives and business. Now it is a desolate and empty space, offering only a dangerous gauntlet for would-be explorers to pass through with constant threat of ambush by the evil host who befouled the once beautiful workshops and residences nearby. Finally there is Uflump Moor. These chambers once acted as the gatehouse of the endless stairs. It is from here that one might once have made the ascent of thousands of steps to the heights of Xerox Sigil, above and thereupon mounted the Tower of Durin, and from there look out upon the wide world below with an eye rivaling that of an eagle himself. Now orcs act as wardens of this place, and they are loath to allow any to pass uncontested. The next exploration deed is the Cliffs of Xerix Ziggle, in which I need to explore Xerix Ziggle. The first landmark is the Door to the Clouds. This gateway opens up onto the face of Xerix Ziggle, the mighty Silver Teen. The next landmark is the Broken Cleft. A great battle took place upon the face of Cloudy Head, a battle between a Balrog and another mighty power. The Balrog's demise broke the mountainside here. Finally, there is Durin's Bane. These are the remains of the mighty fire demon who had hidden itself in Moria in the days of yore. The next exploration deed is Eastern Durin's Way, in which I need to explore the eastern extents of Durin's Way in Moria. The first landmark is Jazzargund. 
The ceremonial chamber of Jazzergun has seen so many rites and pronouncements throughout the ages of Moria that many dwarves claim that Durin's voice is engraved into the very stone from which it is hewn, and can be heard echoing through the vaulted space when all else lies silent. Now one of the dwarf expedition groups has set up an encampment within the chamber, thus hoping to gain control of the eastern halls of Durin's Way, and the clamor of their preparations is ever present. Next is Hadadum. Once the estate to some great dwarf family of old, Hadadum now lies in ruin, inhabited by orcs, or worse. Next is Fehem Doom. Fehem Doom was once inhabited by a dwarf family, renowned for its scholars and mastery of the lore of stone and mining. Alas, most of this lore was irretrievably lost along with the bloodline of the family when Casa Doom fell into darkness, and the halls of these ancient dwarves have long since been stripped bare by the ravages of the orcs. Next is Skoirusk. The nest of Skoirusk echoes with the cries of the Merveil. While this vast cavern was preserved by the dwarves in its natural state for ages past, this place now has become defiled by the presence of these evil creatures, who fall upon any who dare to explore within. Next is Tith Modhul. The Merveil have little love for each other, and each nest guards its territory jealously from the others. It is no different here in the depths of Moria, and no one queen has risen dominant above the others for long. Whether the arrival of the dwarves will prove strong enough to goad them to unite has yet to be seen. Next is Grisherbroom. This high perch has long been used by the Merveil Queens to challenge each other to the battles of Ascendance and rule over the other's broods. So much evil blood has been spilled here over the centuries of darkness that its stains may never be washed from the stone. Next there's Kulturg. This deep black pool once served the Dwarves of Moria as a place of silent contemplation of the depths. Now lies polluted and the air is rent by the raucous cries of the Merovale flocks. There is no peace to be found here now. Finally, there is Darruk. The stone cages of Darruk serve as larders for the Merovale. Captives snatched from outside world are often brought here beyond any hope of flicker of light to be devoured at leisure. The next exploration deed is Zella Melek to explore the region of Zella Melek within Moria. The first landmark is the 21st Hall. In times long past, a great market stood here where the dwarves of Moria and travelers from abroad would trade in goods from across much of Middle Earth. Fine woods, wine, and foodstuffs would be exchanged for gold, priceless gems, and finely wrought pieces of smithcraft. Anything at all could be bought or sold within this very hall, though it is hard to imagine to look upon it now. Next is Mudmul Sharaf. Founded as the dwarves expanded east from the halls of Old Moria to the west, the terraces of Mudmul Sharaf once housed many fine dwarf craftsmen, rather, at least, among those wealthy enough to live but a few halls from the throne of Durin himself. Next is the Hall of Flowing Water. Water has ever been an important aspect of dwarf artistry, as hidden rivers and lakes are among the most vital features of any settlement beneath the hills and mountains. The Hall of Flowing Water is a fine example of this artistry, and it has remained surprisingly intact after so many years unattended.
Next is Gabo Mamak. The original purpose of the Chamber of Gabo Mamak cannot be found in the old texts and histories of Boria. The simple span that crosses this room does not seem to serve any vital purpose, and the wise might argue whether it is a symbolic in nature or whether something of importance was once contained within the space below. Next is the Chamber of Mazarbul. It is likely that the Chamber of Mazarbul once served some great ceremonial purpose in the old days of Moria. Now it remains the tomb of Balin, son of Fundin, and an old friend to Bilbo, who not so many years ago led an expedition much like the current one to retake Moria and restore it to the glories of old. Alas, his efforts came to ruin so final that no one ever returned to their homes to tell the tale of it, and only now has the truth been learned. Next is Gable Hole. Here in Gable Hole once stood a dam constructed to capture the waters of the flow that go through this area and so supply water to the dwarves inhabiting Selimelech. Now lies shattered in ruins among stagnant puddles. Next is the Great Hall of Durin. Within the Grand Hall once stood the throne of Durin the Deathless first and greatest father of the dwarves. Though the first Durin lived a life far beyond the span of any other, he did in time pass away, but always another took up his name and ruled as Durin. The dwarves claim that these rulers are each Durin himself, returned to them from the stone time and again to sit upon the throne of Moria and watch over them, until at last he fell before the power of Durin's bane, leaving the throne empty, perhaps forever. Finally, there is Uzbad Bakan. The shattered plaza of Uzbad Bakan likely hosted the shops of dwarf merchants once long ago. Now it lies mostly silent and strewn with rubble, broken only by the occasional echoing snarl of an orc. The next exploration deed is the Waterworks to explore the Waterworks of Moria. The first landmark is the Rotting Cellar. The brackish damp and mold of the deep waterworks have led the dwarves of the expedition to name this place the Rotting Cellar. The air seems laden with an unhealthy mildew, though the view offered over the once great waterworks of Moria remains awe-inspiring. Next is the Great Wheel. This massive structure once powered the great pumps that moved water about Khaza Doom, providing drinking water for the dwarves, as well as supplying the enormous quantities of water needed to cool the Grand Forges. Nowhere else in Middle Earth could such feats of engineering be found, but as they have been left unmaintained, most of these have fallen into ruin. Next is Durin's Beard. Several underground rivers were discovered flowing through the great caverns that make up Khazad Doom, and all of these were tamed by the dwarves over the centuries. Here, the greatest of these torrents have been brought together for the great waterfall that came to be known as Durin's Beard, in honor of the father of the dwarves. Next is the Lost Palace. Whether this dilapidated structure was ever truly a palace is hard to say. Time and moisture have taken their tolls, and anything of value was either stolen or rusted away long ago. It might have once housed the dwarves responsible for administrating the great waterworks that stretch out of sight from the steps of this building. Next is the Chamber of the Pool. Whatever this place once was, or whatever it contained, it now holds only stagnant, fetid pools and debris. It may have once served as the entrance to an ancient storehouse. Next is the Chamber of the Dark Waters. This ancient storehouse may once have held materials needed to maintain the great mechanisms of the waterworks of Khaza Doom. Now lies quiet, filled with still black water that does not appear to have been stirred by any living things for years.
Next is the Lost Treasury. The surviving records of Casa Doom mark this old storehouse as a treasury. Perhaps this building once overflowed with dwarf gold and jewels. But that was long ago, before the orcs came and stole it all away as tribute for the Dark Lord of Mordor. Next is Narog Kilib. Next to this great pillar, in the ceiling far far above, one can make out an ancient shaft that seems to lead to the upper levels of Moria. Whatever use the dwarves had for it, it now seems that the goblins have since taken to using it as a place to hurl their refuse. Next is Harrisgund. The gateway of Harrisgund leads to the source of the greatest ducks in all of Khazad Doom. It once supplied water to nearly half of all the dwarves who lived beneath the mountains. But it was broken by some unknown calamity during the long dark years after the fall of Durin. Now the water lies here unmoving, flooding the deeps in great stagnant pools. Finally there is the Chamber of Memory. Dwarf scholars believe that the Chamber of Memory was so named because it held a great repository of books and scrolls, storing many the more mundane records of Khazad Doom. If it indeed ever held such records, they have been either stolen away or were destroyed when the waterworks was flooded after the kingdom's fall. The next exploration deed is the Red Horn Lodes to explore the Red Horn Lodes of Moria. The first landmark is the Orc Watch. The Orc Watch has been founded by Broger and Bozy's Dwarf Expedition as a watch post over the Orc Horde that holds the Red Horn Lodes. The Dwarves hope to cut the different Orc tribes off from each other by controlling such key points throughout Moria, but the odds stand brutally against them. Next is the Gate of Ruin. The Gate of Ruin opens upon the endless stair of Khazad Doom, but as its name now suggests, this doorway into the stairs has been shattered and lies in ruin. Next is Sigin Thalrock. Sigin Thalrock is little more than a platform jutting over the rivers of molten fire that have broken this section of the caverns into a set of treacherous stone formations. The dwarves of Old Moria tied them together with a series of stairs and pathways, but these have not been maintained for hundreds of years and can be perilous to the unwary traveler. Next is the Tailing Pit. This vast natural pit was used for hundreds of years by the Dwarves of Khazad Doom to dispose of the tailings left behind by their enormous mining efforts within the Redhorn Lodes. It speaks to the enormous depth of this shaft that in all that time, its bottom yet remains unseen and unsounded. Next is Menemezel. This important looking building must once have been an administrative center for the mining efforts of the dwarves of the Redhorn Lodes. Now, naturally, its interior lies ruined and abandoned for the orcs have little use for it. Next is Malmezel. Malmezel was once a street of sort lined with small buildings. Few of the old records speak of its purpose, though one might guess that it was once filled with workshops or taverns for the dwarves who once worked these mines. Next is Ashpar's Command. In the time of ancient Moria, this building would have served as the quarters of the high foreman of the Redhorn Lodes. Now it acts as the throne of whatever orc has risen to power over his brethren in this vast cavern. Next is Butkul Beckon. Butkul Beckon provides a commanding view of the Great Cavern below. Perhaps in days long past, the mine's overseers stood here to plan out their excavations. Now all one can see are the shattered ruins below, crawling with orcs. The next exploration deed is the Flaming Deeps to explore the Flaming Deeps of Moria. The first landmark is Anazarmakem. Anazarmakem stands as the gatehouse to the Flaming Deeps. While its purpose long ago was mainly a matter of governance, its purpose now is a rallying point for the Dwarf Expedition as it reaches into the lowest caverns of Moria.
The next landmark is the Burning Stair. Travelers passing from the waterworks into the flaming deeps must descend the Great Burning Stair. Once the flames were kept tame and well confined within the furnaces and forges of the Dwarves of Khazad-dûm, but under the brutal care of the orcs, the waters have become contaminated with foul oils and sulfur, and gouts of fire may leap from every chasm and byway. Next is the Crossroad of Ash. The Crossroad of Ash, once it was a great light at the center of the vast dwarf forges. Now its light is overwhelmed by a ruddy burning hue of flames and the eternal black pall of soot that hangs over everything here. Next is the Gate of the Seven Fathers. Dwarf legends speak of the Seven Fathers of the Dwarves, whom they claim awoke from the stone first among the people of Middle-earth, though the elves claim that they were the first to walk beneath the stars. Here the Seven Fathers have been immortalized in a vast work of stonecraft. Next is Hadad Mezer. Hadad Mezer was renowned amongst the dwarves as one of the greatest workshops of Moria. From these forges came some of the finest works of smithcraft from the world. Next is Hermelkezer. Hermelkezer once stood as the palace of an ancient dwarf lord of Moria, though his name has now been lost from the pages of history. Now it stands as a bastion of corruption and evil from which orc captains oversee the labors of their minions and slaves in the hot forges of the flaming deeps. Finally, there is Hudnul Medin. The gates of Hudnul Medin are said to have sealed away some of the most well-protected vaults of the dwarves in the ancient days. But the old texts are not clear on whether they were meant to keep thieves and intruders out or something else in. The next exploration deed is Nudmelek, in which I need to explore the area of Nudmelek, which encompasses the eastern halls of Moria. The first landmark is the first hall. The first hall was the original entrance to khazad where Durin first set foot within the caverns that would one day become the greatest city of the dwarves. Moria was indeed the most enduring city of any people in the long history of Middle-earth, until at last it fell and the end came, as it must to all things. Next is Kadar Zaram. This vast array of stairs allows one to descend from the seat of Durin's power to the greatest hall of Khazad-dûm. Originally a vast natural cavern supported by massive pillars of stone, over the long years the dwarves gradually worked it into a wonder of craftsmanship, with a forest of pillars carved into the great trees supporting the weight of an entire mountain above. Next is the Deep Crossroad. This junction between the Vast Hall and Nud Melek and the Chamber of Mazarbu further to the west seems unimportant in the vastness of Moria, but for some reason Mazog's orcs guard it with a keen vigilance and attack all passerby within. Next is Kurjazer. Kurjazer appears to be the only remaining bridge across the lesser chasm that has rent the Great Hall of Nud Melek. This chasm does not appear in the ancient maps of khazad and it is possible that an earthquake ripped it apart in the year shortly before the appearance of Durin's Bane. Next is the western arch of the Bridge of khazad -dûm. The Bridge of khazad was conceived as an ancient defense designed to deter any who might seek to invade the city. The chasm it crosses is among the largest in Moria, and has been here since the city was founded so many years ago. Its depth seems wholly bottomless to the reckoning of a mortal eye. Now the bridge lies in ruins, its western span jutting forlornly out over the depths of the chasm, the very stone shattered and charred by unknown forces. Next is the Eastern Arch of the Bridge of khazad -dûm. 
The Bridge of Khaza Doom has stood over this great chasm for many an age, but does so no more. The eastern span now reaches out like a finger pointing into the darkness beyond. It seems that whatever destroyed the bridge it fell not so long ago, as flakes of the rock can still be seen occasionally to crack away from the shattered tip to fall away into the chasm and fresh arrows pepper the stonework. Finally, there is Sudulthurk. This great course of stone offers a path to the upper caverns that could be transversed, albeit with some difficulty, by wagons or loaded vehicles. The path below also offers the only alternate road into Moria now that the bridge of Khazad Doom lies ruined. The next exploration deed is the Foundations of Stone to explore the Foundations of Stone in Moria. The first location is the Shattered Refuge. The Shattered Refuge lies in the deepest extents of Moria. Few records remain to describe these caverns, though scholars presume that it was somewhere within that Durin's Bane lay slumbering for uncounted years before the dwarves delved and awoke its wrath. This area can hardly be called a refuge now, save that a small expedition has killed or driven off strange creatures from this section of the cavern and stands a vigilant guard against any that approach. Next is the Endless Stair. This stair was rumored to have been built up through a natural passage that ran from the deepest caverns of Khazad Doom to the frozen heights of Xerox Sigil, far above. Here at the bottom, parts of it appear to have been recently shattered by some terrible force. Next is the Bridge Shard. An enormous shard of stone lies half submerged in this gloomy lake, jutting upwards into an endless darkness. It appears to be a broken remnant of the Bridge of Khazad Doom, fallen from far above when the bridge was shattered. Next is Zabad Fakok. The arches of Zabad Fakok open up the foundations of stone, the deepest caverns in all of Moria. The dwarves of old long shunned these caverns out of a sense of foreboding and lingering darkness that could never be fully dispelled by lantern or torch. But when rich veins of mithril were discovered within, these concerns were set aside and the dwarves began to dig in earnest at the very roots of the mountain. Finally, there is Dalgum Ru. The caverns of Dalgum Ru have never been safe. Even in Durin's day, miners who entered these twisted passages would sometimes disappear without trace, and rarely would an expedition pass through without reporting strange shadows moving just beyond the light of torches, but clearly never seen. Next, there is a deed to complete nine quests, each given by a mirror in Moria. The first one here is in the Palace of Nine. The quest is called Lighting the Way. Next up, there is a mirror down here in the Silver Teen Loads and it gives the quest called Reflections of Rails. And I of course did all these quests during the playthrough. Next, this mirror gives you a quest called A Light in the Garden. There is a mirror here in Zella Melek, and this one gives a quest called Reflecting on the Past. Next there is a mirror here in the Lost Palace in the Waterworks, and it gives the quest Mirror in the Mire. Down here in the Red Horn Loads, there is this mirror which gives the quest Reflector of the Red Horn. In the Flaming Deeps, there is this mirror that gives the quest Reflection of Flame.
This mirror gives a quest called Reflecting on the Past. Finally, this mirror here gives the quest called A Mirror of Hope. Next, there is a deed called Discovering Adventures as Zelamelech to complete quests that are given by the landscape. The first location here is called Bayer's Mur, and it has several quests here to do. I did them during the playthrough, of course. The next location for this deed is called Skithers Ulima, and there will be several landscape quests to complete here as well. The next location with landscape quests is called Mudmul Sharoff. There will be more quests here in the Hall of the Flowing Water. Finally, there will be a ton of landscape quests here in Uzbad Bakan. There is a hidden deed called a Deep Well, and in order to unlock this one, you have to jump down this well here at the Chamber of the Crossroads. Next, there is a deed called the Pits of Moria, in which you have to jump into several pits throughout Moria. So the first one is a pit here in the Great Delving. You have to jump at these very precise locations that I'm jumping at, so if you're trying to follow along, make sure you jump exactly where I jump. Next is the pit here at the Silver Teen Loads, right at the bottom here. And usually you'll get a text pop up if you unlock the pit for that location. You saw a flash there for this one. Next there is a pit here in Jazzergun, right over this bridge. And there's the text again. There is a pit here in the Red Horn Loads as well. There is a pit here in Western Mood Malek. Facing the grand stairs here, or the endless stairs, I should say. Finally, the last one is here in Eastern Mudmilek, jumping into the pit of the Bridge of Khazad-dûm. If you jump from the bridge itself, it doesn't work. For some reason, it has to be from this location here. And you'll see the D pop up once you jump in all these pits. This is also a hidden D. There's the completion. 
Finally, there are the Slayer Deeds, beginning with the Deep Claw Slayer. This is certainly the best place to do it at, over at this library in the Great Delving area. Next, there is the Dragonette Slayer Deed, and the best place to do this is here in the Old Silver Teen City. Next there is the Glob Snaga Slayer, and this little place in the waterworks works very well for this. Or you could farm the downstairs area of Schoolfield with the spiders, those count as Glob Snaga as well. Next there is the Goblin Slayer Deed, and you should have no trouble getting this deed completed if you venture through Moria, but if you just need to sit down and farm it, this is a pretty good place to do it at. Next there is the Grodbog Slayer, and this one can be a little bit tricky, but this is a pretty decent spot for it. You have plenty of opportunities to kill them here. Next there is the Merivale Slayer, and the best place to do this is actually here in the Cliffs of Zerg Ziggle in my opinion. They're more concentrated than that specific area that they have in Eastern Durin's Way. Next there is the Nameless Slayer, and really the only place to do this is down here in the Dark Delvings. There's this corner towards the eastern end of the map that has a good concentration of them. Next there is the Orc Slayer Deed, and again you should have no trouble getting this one accomplished if you venture through all of Moria, but if you again just want to sit down and do it, the Flaming Deeps is actually a decent spot. Next there is the Spider Slayer Deed, and here in the Dark Delvings there's a good spider cave that has plenty of them. You can also farm that downstairs area in Skumfield and double up on the Glob Snaga. Next there is the Troll Slayer Deed, and this is definitely the hardest one because you basically have to ride around here in the Dark Delvings. Some of the instances have trolls, notably the Grand Stairs. But if you're just doing this by yourself, you're gonna have to ride around the entire perimeter of the Dark Delvings to do this. Next there is the Warg Slayer Deed, and a pretty decent spot to do this is here in the Cliffs of Xerix Ziggle as well. You can double up and do the Merivale Slayer as well while you're doing this. Finally, there is the Warm Slayer Deed, and there's a perfect spot to do this in the Flaming Deeps. I think there's a good 15 Worms here. Alright, so now that I'm done with the Deeds, it's time to talk about the Reputation Factions here in the Mines of Moria, so let me pull that up. So there are two factions in the Mines of Moria. And they are the the miners and the guards. So the iron garrison miners and the iron garrison guards. So as far as the miners are concerned, the iron garrison miners seek for the treasures that may still be left unspoiled in the depths of Moria. So let me go ahead and show you what unlocks once you get kindred with them. So the reputation barterer for the Iron Garrison Miners is right over here. He's in the 21st hall, sitting out here on this crate. So let me speak with him. As always, you can gain reputation by killing enemies, doing instances, doing deeds, doing quests. And there's, of course, items that drop that you can use to gain reputation. If you go through Moria and hit the quest, you should have absolutely no problem hitting Kindred. So let's see what sort of goodies he has it for me once you're Kindred. Bargain's company discovered me through you. So he does have some items that you can use as far as armor and jewelry and that kind of stuff. But in my opinion, the most important thing that he trades is if you're a hunter, you can get Guide to the 21st Hall. Very useful uh, skill that you can use. And then for me as a warden, I can get Muster in the 21st Hall. So I'm certainly going to be using that. And as you can see, I got a brand spanking new muster skill that the cooldown's not as bad as some of these milestone ones so 
It's actually a lot easier. And then there are also a few mount items. So I already have this tame red red horn goat, so let me get the nimble one. And I think it already went through. Let's see. And pull up my mounts here. Reputation mounts. So yeah, I got the prize tame red horn goat. And that's the one from earlier. Pretty interesting. It's got some tools behind it. Not bad. Let's go ahead and take a look at the prize nimble red horned goat. And is that the exact same one? Looks exactly the same to me. But whatever. That is the goats. Then there's also the Iron Garrison Guards. The Iron Garrison Guards seek to reclaim Kaza Doom from the evils that have occupied it for so many years. And let me show you what happens when you unlock Kindred with them. The reputation barterer for the Iron Garrison Guards is right over here at the 21st Hall as well. So let me go ahead and browse to see what Would he has for me. A trophy from Durin's Bay? So he's got some shields that are pretty decent, some jewelry as well. But what you're mostly interested in is that he sells a book for each class. So there's one for the burglar, the guardian, so on and so forth. I certainly do want the pathless trod for myself, which is the warden's book. So let me go ahead and buy that. And as you can see, this is for a quest, the pathless strahd for myself. So this is a narrative detailing the author's travels with the Rohirrim and describes their martial prowess with spears. So this is going to grant me a trait point. Excellent. So I completed that. Man, I got one class point. I might as well use it, right? Why not? I don't even know what to put it on. So, ability to consume a bleed. What is this? 10% incoming healing debuff to the target. Just gonna start stacking that for now. I may change it later. There you go. So, let's see what this popped up about. Some Lotro points. Alright, so those are the two reputation factions here. So that's it, my friends. That is the end of Season 12. That is the end of the Mines of Moria. As always, please be sure to go to renaissancegaming.net slash lotro.html. Scroll down to the completionist checklist. You can click Moria to see all the quests that I've done here. If I need to come back for any. If there are any deeds that I need to come back to. All that sort of stuff. It's all logged. It's all tracked. I spent hours and hours and hours compiling that list. Making sure I'm not missing anything. Making sure the information is up to date. That way I can ensure that this is in fact a 100% playthrough of the game. So, before I head to Lothorian, there is one final quest here. As you can remember, and it segues me outside towards the light, finally. So, greet the sky. Here we go. If we are to find Mithril in Casa Doom, we will first have to deal with the orcs. It is time for us to set foot in the open air once more. I do not know about you, but I never thought that Casa Doom would be so deadly. I'm glad I will have completed my venture across all of it, but gladder still to have made it out alive. Come Kippen, let us go smell the fresher air. Alright my friends. To the Dale. Let's go Kippen. So I'm not going to speak with him just yet. We will do that in the next episode and in the next season. So thanks again for another great one. See you guys next time.